name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm sure that many of us have heard one or another version of this story that I'll share with you. Uh, I think probably it's not a real story. I think it's probably a joke. Uh, at least I hope so. Um, it's a story about uh, any kind of unlikely person. I've heard it three different ways. You may have heard it other unlikely people. I've heard it told about a kind of a surfer dude. Uh, I've heard it told about a convict in prison. And I've also heard it told about a sort of a, a, a hard party in college student. Uh, choose any unlikely person like that uh, that suits you. Uh, there are probably many versions. Uh, and anyways, as the story goes, that unlikely person uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ for the sole reason because they found out that Jesus' first miracle uh, was to turn water into wine. Uh, in other words, uh, as the story goes, uh, Jesus was at the wedding party, and somebody called out to him and said, Hey, Jesus, we're out of wine. And he said, You know, uh, I don't usually do this, but bring, let the party continue. Uh, and so thinking that Jesus was some kind of a party animal himself, he thought, I, that's the kind of God I'd like to follow. Um, I doubt, as I said, that's a true story. At least I hope it's not that conversion because Jesus is a party animal uh, story. I hope not because that particular aspect of the story, I think, is pretty far from the point of our gospel lesson today. We just heard it. Uh, Mary was at a wedding Jesus and his friends, his disciples were there too, and the wine ran out. And Mary points out that fact, that simple fact, to Jesus. And Jesus, as the typical interpretation goes, he kind of is uh, insulting or uh, backsassing his mother, right? We had it translated as, woman, what is that to you or to I? If we had it in modern language, we would just have you know, uh, him saying, so what? You know, it's not my problem. Uh, if it had been my mother, that's the point where she would smack me right on the lips. <laughs> or, to be more accurate, she, my mother flicked us on our, on our mouth when, uh, when we said something we weren't supposed to. So if you want me to shut up, just come at me like that, uh, and you'll know. Uh, <laughs> so Jesus says, uh, woman, so what? It's not my problem. Mary, I think smartly, as most uh, effective mothers uh, do, he, she uh, ignores her son's sass, right? No arguing back and forth. She just turns to the servants and says, do what he tells you to do. See, she knows, I think, Mary, like most moms, that despite the sassy back talk from her kid, he's going to do, he knows better than to ignore her request. You've been there, I've been there. Uh, when, my mom, when I was a kid and my mom would say, your room's a mess, I, might, I wouldn't be nearly as bold as Jesus. I might say under my breath, so. Uh, but then I'd go clean it <laughs> because I knew better uh, than to not do what my mother had asked me to do. And just like that, Jesus does it. Um, it's really incredible, this part of this story, Right? Because there's not a big flourish. There's not a big moment. There's not a big miraculous thing that happens. Right? There's one instruction from Jesus. I, I like to look at it as an invitation. He said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they accepted his instruction or his invitation. They filled them. And the result, somewhere in there, from the moment the jars became full... Sometime between that moment and when they drew some out, that was his next instruction, draw some out and take it to the chief steward. When it got to the chief steward, he simply, that's the only reason we know that it turned to wine. He said, wow, great wine. Uh, and I thought we had run out. That's the only way because there's no miraculous moment where the skies part, right? There's no uh, abracadabra. There's no Jesus standing dramatically before the six stone jars and, and holding his arms up to the heavens and asking God the Father to do something miraculous. None of that goes on. Just two invitations into service that are obeyed. 
fill the jars with water, and then draw some out and take it to the steward, the chief steward. We could miss the whole thing if we weren't paying attention. An invitation into partnership and an acceptance of it, that same invitation. And then the miracle is triggered. Something mundane, something every day as water becomes something holy and fine and beautiful. And you'll blink if you miss it. So this, we, you know, interestingly enough, uh, we studied this lesson at men's Bible study breakfast last Friday morning. And we went all over the place with it. And one of the things we were struggling with is why? You know, why would this be what Jesus chose as his first miracle? It can't really be just about keeping the party going, though it did do that. But of all of the ways that Jesus could really begin his public ministry, of all of the miracles that he could have done, right? He could have, uh, uh, for his first miracle, he could have given sight to somebody who was blind, or he could have uh, 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 healed somebody who was lame and they walked again, or uh, any number of different things. And he chose something that to us, in, uh, from our perspective, seems kind of um, curious, right? Of all of the things that Jesus could have done. To, inter, to, to, to inaugurate his public ministry, he chooses kind of a, what seems to us from our sort of cultural standpoint, it's kind of a party trick. And we don't get it. What we don't get because our culture is so different from that culture is that this wasn't really anything less, any less compassionate than a more uh, typical miracle that we might be looking for. It looks like that to us, because in our culture, we go, you know, to a wedding, and there's a reception afterwards, and it lasts a few hours, and um, if, if the booze runs out, um, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, it must be time to go home. Um, no big deal. Uh, that's just the way wedding receptions go. Um, for Jesus' culture, it was completely different, right? Wedding festivals lasted days. It was a, an event for the whole village. And what Jesus was doing here, why this was a profound act of compassion, is that he was saving a neighbor from humiliation, cultural humiliation, right? Put yourself in that place at that time. One of the commentators I read this week put it this way. The wedding host runs out of wine, it's inconvenient, but it'll probably acknowledge, perhaps even embarrassing, from our point of view, is it really a big deal? It is a big deal. Because in that time and place, running out of wine too early at a wedding isn't just a social faux pas, it's a disaster. Because wine isn't merely a social lubricant, you see, it's a sign wine is of the harvest, of God's abundance, of joy and gladness and hospitality. So when they run short of wine at a wedding, it means they're running short of God's blessing. And that's a tragedy. It says something bad about the bridegroom, about the couple. It's a bad omen. It's inauspicious. It means that this wedding, this couple that's coming together does not have God's blessing. And to run out of, of wine in that way, running out of God's blessing is very inhospitable, and it had social ramifications beyond the day of the wedding. And people could be ostracized from society. That, that union would never be looked upon as blessed by God simply because the wine ran out. You see, so what Jesus was doing was an act of profound compassion, saving people, saving his neighbors from this utter social humiliation. All right, that's the first part. That's our sort of surface level understanding of what was going on here. An important miracle now because it's an act of love and compassion. Our spiritual level was a little bit deeper for interpretation. On the spiritual level, this says to us that transformation from something mundane to something holy is possible if we accept Christ's invitation to us. 
okay, water into wine can be a metaphor for our transformed lives. Our mundane can be made miraculous by the acceptance of Christ's invitation to us. And don't miss the fact that this is not Jesus sort of refilling a couple of glasses of wine, you know. <laughs> I said this at the earlier service. I said, we're not talking about Ian J. Gallo here. Uh, somebody said to me walking out, that's my favorite wine. What are you talking about? <laughs> I said, we're not talking about some, some box of wine. Uh, first of all, we're talking about an incredibly huge amount of wine, right? Six jars, each jar carrying 20 to 30 gallons. That's 120 to 180 gallons of wine, which is supposed to say to us, this is an unimaginably large amount of wine. I read somewhere that it equals 1,000 bottles in the way that we measure wine. I'm not sure if that's the case, but you get the idea. The idea is this is a mind-bogglingly large quantity of wine that Jesus has made. And not just any wine, again, not just some jug wine, although we have jugs. We're talking about the very best wine on earth, right? And so the amount and the quality are supposed to be, I think, metaphors for us for the measure and the quality of God's grace and God's love for us. That God's grace and God's love for us are unending and overflowing more than we can imagine, immeasurable, and not only that, but fine and sublime and perfect, the very best that you can imagine. That's a spiritual interpretation of the water to wine. But what I don't want us to overlook finally is the practical aspect for our lives of faith. Jesus did a miracle as an act of compassion for a neighbor. And it means for us that God's love and grace for us is overflowing and perfect. But it means something more, I think, it, it, as every Bible lesson does, needs to mean something for us that we can take with us when we walk out to the door to do something out in God's kingdom. And that point comes in the, in the, in the part of the story where there's that little hook, that little hinge that's so easy to miss, um, where... Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water, right? That is an invitation. See, Jesus could have just done the miracle all by himself. Imagine that. Jesus standing before six mostly empty jugs of water, right? He has the power to just sort of wave his hands over those jugs and fill them with water himself or to skip the water step altogether. If he just wanted to make wine to make the party go on, he could have just done it. Could have just filled six jugs with wine miraculously, however that might have worked. But he chose not to do it by himself. This is the case so many times when God is, is doing miraculous things in the world. God is inviting us to be his partner in that miracle. And we see it in this story by that little invitation. Jesus saying to those servants, fill the jars with water. And in essence, saying to them, I want for you to be a partner with me in this miraculous sign that we will do together. It says to us that God gives us that same invitation in our lives every day, more than once a day, probably. There are jars in your life that are mostly empty of water. And every day, God says to you, fill your jars with water. Every day, God says to you, join me in making a miracle, in doing something beautiful for the kingdom of God. You have to, it's for you to decide what those jars, those empty jars are in your life that God is inviting you to put water into so that he can then do something with you to make a miracle in the world. Fill your jars with water. For each and every one of us, the jars are different in some way. But there is somebody lonely in your life who has lost all hope of any miracle. Put water in your jar 
and go to them so that God can take your going, the water of your going, and turn it into a wine of miracle. Because for that lonely person in your life who's given up hope, your presence, your touch, your love, your word is no less miraculous than water turning to wine. There's someone excluded in your life, someone ostracized, someone hated. Put water in your jar and go to them with a touch, a word, an act of love that God can take as your water and turn it into the miracle of wine. And for those people, it will be no less of a miracle than when Jesus turned water to wine at this wedding. If I could give you one last example, I'll say uh, this week we've been uh, spending time with our companions uh, from Cuba, they've been here uh, with us since last Wednesday, and that uh, struck me as an example of this parish on the parish level, taking the jars that God has given us and filling them with water so that God can make something beautiful and miraculous out of it. I went down to Cuba two years ago and asked the bishop there because our Cuba ministry here was mostly dead. It was an empty jar. I said, shouldn't maybe we do something else down here because this doesn't seem to be working? And she basically said to me, put water in Christ Church's jar and take it to this little church in this little town and let God turn it into wine. And that's what God has done because we said yes to that invitation over the last two years. And if you were with us on Wednesday to see the miracle that God has done, and I might add, by the way, that they filled their jars with water as well. Water of love for us. Water of faith for us. Every missionary from this church who has gone down there has had their water turned to wine, you see. Those opportunities come to us every day. Every day, God says to each and every one of us, put water in your jar because I want to make wine with you. Amen.